hope it works. Yes, it seems like we are now recording. Um, and we have quite a few people already online. Um, and we will immediately start, I would say, with um, the list of things that I've uh, gotten via email. So quite a few people have been uh, sending emails with questions. And I would suggest we just go immediately um, into the questions. And there's several people that have been following the, um, the programming of the scroll game that I'm doing next or parallel to the, uh, the, the slides. And that's something I will start with now, if I can find the right window. There it is. So um, I'll be about, there we go. Let me also see where the participants and the chat window are. There we go. OK, so now I can see all the things you're entering via chat as well. So if you have a question, as before, please um, record it via the chat window. And um, then I'll hopefully in real time answer to those questions. So one of the remarks that was made, and that is a very good remark, it's something that's, um, that was fixed somewhere in the middle, I think, as well, is um, while programming the line color. So the line, the squiggly line that we started with with this um, game, um, has a particular color for every point on the line and we give it also a random color um, and these random colors are over here visible as these pairs right so in n curses you can define a color for a particular uh, cell on the screen and you have a foreground and a background color that's what these pairs really mean and we select just a random one of those pairs um, and what I had was this so basically I had a random number between zero and two eventually that uh, came out of here even though I had uh, multiple pairs and I also in the common sets that I wanted to have four different ones so um, if we wanted that then indeed we should have had four here so we'll come back to the modal operator in a second with another exercise um, for the, the third exam type of question that I already uh, distributed via Moodle, but this is this is indeed true. So basically, this um, needs to be Moodle four to have four different um, random or a random value between zero and three, basically. And this will then select the the color pair eventually. Right. So um, another question was if we um, execute the game. I hope this is still kind of relevant. Yes. Um, you see these little white dots. Also, this is something that I actually did at the end of, um, of the programming tasks. That is basically right here. So these lines were not really visible in any of the videos. So here I basically add a dot or a, a space character. Um, and uh, this, in a ve very rarely, I add the dot. So this has, it has an effect that now and then a dot is uh, being seen in the sky and otherwise not. It's just, you know, something that I added later on and that I n never mentioned really in the video. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to um, show is that um, in the last video or the second to last video, I believe, we had um, in line.h, um, these constant uh, keywords behind every member function that is not changing the data of the class. So in this case, position, color, uh, lines or columns are uh, belonging to the class line. They're private, so they're hidden. And whenever we've seen, whenever you have a, a method or a function that belongs to this class that doesn't change any of this, you can tell the compiler that is by adding const. Now you don't need to do this all, um, just in the header file where you have the, 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 the contract for the class, so to say, but you have to do this in the CPP file as well. So over here for the constructor, we don't have this because there we definitely change the data, but for get y position and get color, for instance, also here we need to add const. This is something that uh, somebody remarked. Um, just for, you know, this is something I didn't do um, in the lecture, but you should also um, exactly copy this in the CPP file as well. Otherwise, the compiler will complain and uh, it will have an error, I think, or a, a warning 
no, it's an error um, that uh, will describe what it expects, but you should then also in the CPP file declare that this function is not changing anything that belongs to the class or any data that belongs to the class. So in this case, we just return the color plus one in this case, um, and we don't change this data. Okay. Right, so that's um, it for the scroll game example that we had. So let's now go to the different example or go for the exam questions. Um, so last time, um, one of the, okay, in exam polls, you name, um, and uh, we had the, um, I think it's an exam two. CPP, right? We had this question over here, which I said is, you know, for an, it will be, uh, or it is actually indicative for an exam question. It was an exam question in the past. Um, and it's, and there are multiple ways of solving this. Um, so some of you had immediately in the chat window uh, given me the solution after a while, which is great. And some of uh, you asked about the solution. How would you do this? Um, or how would you make this much shorter? So I'll do this again now just to make sure that everybody is following this example first and foremost, but also that, there, that it's visible how there are sometimes multiple solutions and sometimes solutions are a little bit uh, nicer or more elegant or at least much shorter in terms of what you need to program. So just to reiterate the exam question, this case is we need to write a function Zorro um, and it takes n, the integer n as a parameter and uh, it should then um, not return anything as a function, but it should output something to the console. Namely, it should print basically a big Z or Z um, that has the size of N. So if N is five, as you can see here, it will print out this. If N is six, it will print out that, etc. And the idea is here that you do this for N being five or larger. So it could also be 105, it could also be 1,000, et cetera, depending on your screen size, that should still be able to work. Now we've seen the, I think, the, the easiest to understand implementation of this function. So in the main function, we basically ask for this n, this number over here, and then we execute Zorro, and Zorro, the function, basically just draws the z or z on the screen. Um, and what we said is basically the easiest way to draw this set is by looking first at three phases. The first one is we print out these five x's over here on the first line. And we've seen also that we need to do exactly this at the last line as well. Um, so we've seen here that we print uh, n times an x for the first line of x's. And we do that exactly for the last time of x. So that's already a large part of the objective solved. The only thing we need to do is uh, go for these x's in the middle, these uh, in the diagonal. And we've seen there that um, we could do this with uh, a nested for loop where we basically say for every um, uh, line beyond the first line, so we go from line uh, one and we make sure that line is smaller than n minus one, so we don't go for the last line we increment line. So this is basically for all the lines between the first and the last line that we iterate. And then uh, the idea is that we print a number of spaces and then we print always the x and an end line. Always printing the x and end line is done over here. And this number of spaces varies. So for the first line, we've seen that we need to print one, two, three spaces. And then the x for the second line, we have one, two, and then the x for the third line, we have one, and then the x, et cetera. And the tricky thing here for, the exam, uh, for this uh, exam question, when you want to solve this, is exactly this line 34 over here. So you need to start with um, an, uh, a variable that iterates over the space or counts the amount of spaces, and you need to stop at exact right position. And we've seen here, or we basically counted it, we basically said for n is five, we're just kind of going to try this out. And we found that um, space need to be always smaller than n, which is in this case five, for instance, minus line minus one, if line starts at one in this case. Okay, so, so this, is, this is one way of solving it. Now, I'm going to solve it in a much shorter. So let's see how many lines this is. 
So this is about 20 lines. Um, we're going to cut most of those and make this a lot shorter because there is one way to do this um, as a, a nested loop. Um, and in just one nested loop, then one if statement where lots of things are compacted together, you could do this as well. So let's start with creating the nested loop first. This. Um, where we go for first the lines. I'll do that with the, uh, uh, the variable i and then the columns I'll do via the variable j. And that is already correct. You basically have here for each n a bitmap that is n by n. So in this case, five by five or six by six. And if you do that, then you can actually for each pixel in this bitmap that you can then say, you could say either I would like to write an X here or an empty space. And then after each line, you just need to do an end line to, um, to take care of the, the visualization of the bitmap. So after each um, set of columns, so this inner for loop is basically for all the columns. After that, we have to output an end line. So it goes on to the next, um, the next line. And then here we basically just have an if test that either then prints an X or in any other case, um, prints out a space. So that is the, the, the objective here that we basically then find out in which cases we need to print an X and in which cases we need to print the empty space. And this is much shorter than those 20 lines we had already. So this is basically already the number of lines we should have. So we can also just get rid of this. So it's even one less. Now the tricky bit is here in line 30. What do we say here? Or what do we test for here? Now, one of the things we can test for straight away is whether this is the first or the last line. And the way we can test for this is we can basically say if i um, equals zero, then we basically need to write an X at all cases. Or, um, logical or, if I equals N minus one, that is exactly the same. So if the last line is reached over here, so in that case, I equals N minus one. So in this case, uh, four, because remember, I starts at zero. So zero, one, two, three, four. So if i is four in this case, for n is five, um, we also need to print x's all the time. And then uh, the only thing we need to check for still is these uh, middle cases. And there I also advise you just like, um, um, we've done it already multiple times for devising some type of routine or an algorithm. Um, how do we decide where to put these x's here? So everything else is normally an empty space, but here the x is when i is um, 1 and j is 4. Here when i is 2 and j is 2. And here when i is 3 and j is 1. And in all other cases, we have an empty space here. Now, how can you say, as a, so, so say that when in these cases um, uh, i and j take these values, you get 1. And then somebody did already came up last week or two weeks ago. Um, if we have uh, the case where i plus j equals n minus one, then exactly then we can write an x. You can try this out for five. You know, so in this case, only for this line, um, i plus j is four. And only for this line, i plus j is four. And only for this line, i plus j is four and no other lines. And the same goes for here. So you can test it for any six and seven. Um, so if you have this case, then we write an X and otherwise we write an empty space. Okay, so this is basically um, the solution already. So we can save this and try this out. Um, so note that this is about half or even less than half of the lines that we had for our um, more more straightforward um, solution. So in this case, if we have, uh, if we compile this, 
And if we compile this without seeing what the output is, it will always use a out as we've seen. So we should give it a number. And also there it will work, whether this number is big or not so big. Right. This is very big. Okay. So um, just to come back to this, um, in this case, our function is much shorter, but it is, of course, a completely different approach. Um, in this case, you say what we need to print is somehow a bitmap. And then for each line, we print either an X or an empty space. So this sometimes has um, big repercussions. In this case, our code is much smaller. Uh, and it, you would need to do a bit of commenting here that you know, this is, for instance, for the lines, that this is for the columns. I think this is something that you definitely needed to do. Better would be here to even use those variables again. So lines and columns, for instance, etc. cetera. Um, but, um, I, I think you get the, the gist here of what I needed to do. Okay. Right. So then let's go to the third exam question, which I already posted on uh, the Moodle website, um, just as a preparation for this. I'm not sure if anyone tried this already, um, but uh, if you do, this will be a, a, an exam question. I changed the, the size from 90 to 9 in this case, because in this case we can, or we should actually try it out to see if it works or not. Um, and important in that case is that um, uh, we can actually, we don't have to type 90 numbers, but 9 in that case is easier. So in this case, most of the things are already, like in an exam question, typically most of the exam, uh, uh, of the, the code is already provided for you. You don't have to, uh, know that you have to include IO stream or how you use several aspects of this namespace uh, STD, for instance, all of that is given. In this case, even the main function is given um, and a little bit of how the user is inputting things just to make sure that no one starts there looking or searching too deep for um, how the input needs to happen. In this case, uh, this is the first thing that we can already start uh, programming. So in this case, I will make on the exam on paper clear that you will have to fill in something here and that you will have to fill in something here. And so we have in this case a for loop that basically just instructs the user to enter um, nine uh, integers in this case. And that's what the, the question is, um, is asking for. And in that case, the, the first part is fairly simple, I would say. So if I start at one, and we start here at one so that we can ask uh, enter integer one, enter integer two, et cetera, all the way until nine. But we know that i needs to be smaller than or equal to nine or smaller than 10 in this case. Uh, so this is, this is one of the first things that you can, I think, uh, easily uh, put in. And then we need to put this integer into a variable. And, um, and I think this is uh, where uh, this thing comes in because this is obviously a question where you need to give an array of integers or to use an array of integers uh, to handle the input alone. And an array of integers we've seen is, for instance, like this. So we have an integer array. So this is um, an array of size, nine in this case. Um, we call this num for numbers. Um, we could also initialize it here, but since we're going to give user input here, we don't really need to do that, I would say. Um, especially on an exam question, all these type of um, things that you normally would do for a real programming, I think uh, can be left behind. In this case, um, this would be perhaps also part of the exam question, or I would basically just write this already, and then you would have to write here in the instruction what you um, give this as. In this case, the tricky bit is that you don't write i, because um, the array goes from zero uh, to eight in this case. So you should go from, uh, so you should, in this case, print i minus one. So i goes from one, so this becomes first zero, then one, two, et cetera, and i stops at nine, so in this case goes to eight. And so this is the tricky bit usually with, um, with arrays in C. So that is the basic first thing you need to solve. So now we have this part solved, we can actually then um, store all the integers that the user has given us into this uh, array that we call number uh, or num. The second part 
of the question is that we need to print all the even numbers first and then all the odd numbers. And here I gave a little bit of a hint of what you really should do with it, which basically sort out the even numbers from the odd ones and then print the even ones first and then the odd ones. And also here there are multiple ways of doing this. One of the ways is that you could, for instance, here um, create uh, two arrays. So you could say we create the odd numbers and um, maximally you can have nine because the user can only give nine and we can also give the even numbers. And then we basically um, add a number to each of those arrays. This is one way of doing this. And then at the end, you first print the odd numbers and then you print the even numbers. Taking care, of course, that you print only um, those numbers that are really entered in this array. Even though this array is of size nine, you will have less usually than those. That is one way and that I would say is the more straightforward way. But there are other ways of dealing with this question as well. One would be, for instance, to say we sort all the numbers in exactly this, uh, a similar array, like numbers. So, um, I mean, let's give an example here. You could have given here first a couple of numbers like this. These are seven, eight numbers in this case. Those are the numbers. And you basically need to sort these first, the even ones, and the uneven ones. So you basically say, first, we need to get seven somewhere. What you could do then is that you put seven all the way at the end, because that is an odd number, and the odd ones need to be at the end. Then you get to the next one, which is four. Four is an even one, so we put four here. Two is also an even one, so we put two over here. One is an odd one, so we put one at the end. Nine is also an odd one, so we put nine at the end as well. Four is an even one, so we put four over here. Five is an odd one, so we put five here. And then three is an odd one, so we put three here. So what I've just done is kind of manually created uh, one pass through an algorithm where I basically take all the even ones and put those at the start of the array and where I put all the odd ones at the end of the array. And I basically just kept a tap on where I stopped in a way. Okay, so this, this, this is what I'm going to do as a solution here, which is not the straightforward solution. I would say that only a fraction of people would solve it this way, perhaps. But I think it is also quite an elegant solution, so that's what we'll see now as well. Now, if I want to do that, I need to somehow mark where I left these numbers. So when I left with three or also um, five, I basically left here a number that says I have three um, even numbers and I have three odd numbers. Or I could actually point at the index of this sorted array. And I basically say um, the index where I assume my next number will be is four, and where, I, where my next uh, odd number will be is five. I started at eight, then seven, then six and then five for the odd numbers. And I started at zero, then one, then two for the even numbers. So I basically have just two um, numbers that point to the index in these arrays. Okay. So, and I'll just use integers for that. So I just say even um, index, um, let's call that index, and um, odd index. Um, and then here, normally you would also have to say um, index in sort um, to the next odd number to be added. I hope this is somehow uh, descriptive enough. Um, and the same for the rest one, and then the other one. So to the Next even number to be added. Okay. Um, right. So this is exactly. I mean, so basically, what I was uh, explaining here is exactly the, the algorithm that we are going to simplistic algorithm or heuristic we're going to implement here. So we need to first sort everything, and for that, we need to of course have a for loop. Um, let's create the variable i as usual. Um, which in this case 
goes from zero to eight, so it's smaller than nine in that case, and we increment i at all, at every case. And then we need to test first if um, the number in that we have now filled in, that the user gave us, is odd or even. And that is something that we have already seen in the lecture, so odd or even we can test with this modulo. So if we um, do modulo two of a number, uh, we basically say if you divide it by two, what remains is then either zero or one. And if it's zero, then you have an even number. And we do this for every number in the num array. So this is basically how we're going to solve it. So if the, the number, the current number, starting at zero and one and all the way to eight, um, modulo two is zero, then we know that we have an even number. So in that case, we can say if we have an even number, then we do something. Um, if this is not the case, then we automatically know, because if it's not even, it must be odd um, that, if it's, that it's an odd number. And then we do something else. Right? So that is, that is the idea here. Now, the tricky bit here is what do we do in that case? We have to put in sort or in the, in the sort array over here, um, um, at the right index, so this is where we need to fill something in, num i, so the current number that we're looking at. And that's exactly the same we're having to do here. Right. So then the, the real question is, which index are we going to do? Of course, we're going to start at the even index when it's even over here, and the odd index when it's odd over here. But we need to start somewhere. And so in this case, the even index, we said starts at the left. So there we start over here at index zero. And the odd index starts at the end. So in this case, it starts at uh, eight. Right? So this is the eight uh, index, this is the zero index, if you start at zero. And then we need to, um, of course, also change it. So if the number is even, then at uh, that index, or at index zero, um, we write number. And then after that, we have to, of course, increment the even index to one. This is something we can do at the next one as a, a separate statement. So we could say even index um, uh, plus one, for instance, that is the shorter way already. Uh, we could also increment it, that is even shorter. But even shorter, um, and this is just a, a, a peripheral preference, um, is to do this as a prefix. So in this case, and this is the, here the prefix, uh, the suffix, I mean, um, of the increment is really important because you basically give to sort as an index, even index. So then that number is then put in uh, zero for the first iteration. Um, and, then, and then only then afterwards, even in X incremented. So I, I like this short way of doing things, um, but you could also have done it you know, as an extra statement, for instance, afterwards, which is sometimes a little bit more readable if you, um, if you don't want to think so deeply of whether this is correct or not. Uh, so but let, let, let's just do it like this, because that will make it quite short as well. Right, and we'll do exactly the same here, although here the uh, index starts at eight and needs to be decremented, not incremented. So there we decrement that, and that basically takes care of our sort array. So after we've gone through this for loop, we basically have done exactly what I've done here by and in the sketch, basically. So I, I basically um, put the number from the num array at the exact position where I wanted it in the sort array. So now everything is sorted the way it should be. So the remainder is then fairly simple. So we print out, um, print out the sorted sort, which is in this case the sorted array, which has uh, to start the even numbers and um, only then the odd numbers. So in that case, I have i equals zero, um, i still smaller than nine, for instance. And then we basically go and um, not no if test, we basically just immediately output 
the contents of the sort array. Um, so we basically just say sort i is what we print. And to make things a little bit easier to, to uh, show, we could put a comma in between there, or I'll just put an empty space. And to make sure then that what you return um, is not, uh, or that the prompt does not uh, go on the same line, we also end that line at the end. So this will basically, hopefully, I think this should be okay, um, solve this question. So the tricky part here was to really sort uh, the numbers into a second uh, array. So first, to get the numbers was the easy part. This would, uh, in the exam, have certain points assigned to it. The writing is also uh, of this sorted area is also fairly simple, but the really hard part is what you do here, the fact that you solve this, for instance, with these indices. But as I said, you could also have done this differently uh, with, for instance, two arrays, one for the odd ones and one for the uh, even ones, where you print these out separately. It would be a little bit longer, um, but of course also um, correct. Let's now see if this, uh, if this worked. So, we'll compile this. Okay, no errors. So, we'll save this. So, if we now just give out a few numbers, both odd and even, then we'll see that first even ones are printed and then the odd ones are printed. So, this is indeed the right answer. Um, to the question. And um, there might be also more. Um, there are actually other uh, solutions or other ways you could have done this. Um, one way you could have done this is actually uh, solve this straight in the inputs um, to, to make it even shorter. Uh, but I think this step-by-step uh, -step way of thinking is usually the more enlightening or the, the, the easier to follow. Right? So um, this is basically one of the answers to this exam question. Of course, I will put um, the source code of this also on the Moodle website. Right, so the odd numbers are not in the correct input order. Uh, let me see. So we have five is the first thing that we inputted, so that, that is at the end. Then one, which is at the second last. Then five, which is at the third last and then three, which is the last. So yeah, true, they're not in the, in the order that we put them, but that was not part of the exam question. Oops. Right, so print out all the even numbers before all the odd numbers out on the console. But you're right, I mean, you could have also sorted those, which is a little bit more work as well. So I, I did hear the, the slightly easier variant. And then somebody already answered with uh, uh, function sort to sort everything according to that. Also a very good example here. Exactly, with recursion, indeed. Um, and it looks like that is indeed the correct way. It nicely, by the way, also um, illustrates how you can uh, I'm not sure I give you random numbers as uh, the inputs, um, but it's perfect. So um, also here you give the array as a parameter to the function. So also that would have been uh, correct, yes. Okay, any other uh, remarks on this? Um, explain a little bit more of the exercise four. Exercise four is, I'll have to look now at what exercise four is. Just a second. The exercise sheet four or exercise four? Sheet four, okay, good. Um, let me um, open the PDF so I can make sure that I don't tell anything wrong. Right. Um, so there have already been people solving it. So um, the so fast that I didn't even catch up with the check command. So that that was still uh, not functioning correctly. And some people even solved it before the check command functioned it. Um, so um, we have only two exercises. Uh, but please do not dis uh, uh, underestimate um, these exercises because. 
um, they can be a little bit tricky. And the first exercise should be kind of clear. And I'm thinking that this is not really what you're asking about, right? So in the first exercise, um, everything that you have to do is basically create a class and implement it just like we've seen in the lecture with the line example. In this case, with the class citizen, where you have to provide the header file and the CPP file. Um, and you create a program where you, um, with the main citizen.cpp file in this case. Let me, uh, well, I'm, I don't need to share, I think, this, but um, what, what you basically need to do here is just collect a few things um, from the lecture that we've already seen. So I think if you want to solve exercise one, you basically look at the slides and the lecture, uh, the last two le lecture videos, I think, that should uh, solve everything that you have here as a question. Uh, one thing that you might have questions about is how to implement, implement the name um, of this uh, citizen, which is, uh, in this case, I, I've said there should be a, a character area of 70 characters. So you should not really implement it as a string yet, but I think that is also the easier way of implementing it. Um, shall, uh, okay, a, a similar exercise. Um, I can do that, um, okay, next week, of course, it is a little bit late. Um, I will actually give an exercise uh, for the lecture that I'm going to um, film by next Monday, okay? So I will actually do this as part of the lecture. So you'll have to look at the next lecture video, which is lecture video 23, I think. And then I will give something that is similar enough. So at least you'll have a bit more of a hint. I mean, so for now, um, in terms of the um, of getting an example of a class, I think we've seen the cat example, um, and we've seen the line example in the lecture. Um, but I could make an example that is a little bit closer to the citizen example. Okay, so this is something that we could do. I'll have to think of something, um, but this is what I will do to um, to make sure that we can do this. I also have a question to the first. Um exercise of the exercise sheet four. Um, how do we actually implement the attributes in there? Like do we need just do we need just the functions which are um, which are stated in the um, in the sheet or do we need another getter or setter function to set the um, in this case um, uh, well you could do it um, but you don't have to. I think that is this I mean, I mean, I know where this question is coming from because, um, um, of course, it doesn't make sense if you implement a class and you put everything like the name, the age, um, and language as something that is um, that is uh, that, that that can be accessed from uh, beyond. So within this main citizen. So I would actually recommend in this case to do this in another way. Um, so yes, that is that is that is how I would uh, would do it. Um, another thing is, of course, um, what is asked here um, is that the say hello uh, method um, needs to immediately already print things out on the on the uh, on the console. You could also do things like that. You could also instead of getting um, the get uh, function. I mean, in a way, in this case, we are fairly loose. You could do the setting of all the data directly in the constructor. I think that is the easiest way. Because all that is asked in main citizen is that you create two objects. Um, and um, it says also here with the constructors. And then it basically implements the or it would, uh, should execute the say hello function. So I think but there, what, yeah, go ahead. Uh, but Sorry, but, but, but for example, the, the um, age, um, it's like, feels like not really needed. If I yeah, in that correctly. case, you don't need to have the set age function, exactly. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I would, I mean, in any case, you can, of course, and it won't be wrong if you do, but you, um, you don't really need it in this case anyway, because in the question, it explicitly asks to implement it with the constructor. So basically say, just uh, create two citizens with the constructors as seen above, um, and those constructors also already do uh, the filling of the data for the citizen. So I think in this case, you can definitely do without uh, a getter or a setter in this case. All right, thank you. No problem. 
Any other questions related to this? Um, so somebody had troubles with the with uh, supplying um, the string most likely, right? So once you have uh, you want to create uh, a citizen or an instance um, or an object um, a citizen that is a citizen of class citizen, then you need to supply a name. And uh, inside the citizen class, you supply or you implement this as a name that can be maximally um, uh, 70 characters long. Um, and you need to fill this somehow in the constructor. The question is, you need to then, uh, how do you do this? And you need to indeed supply a character array that you then also um, uh, can parse through. Um, how you do this is also seen in the lecture, in fact, how we've seen uh, the passing of um, a character. We've seen also that this uh, that this is not uh, called by um, value anymore, but called by reference. Um, but this is something that we've seen already in uh, chapter six. So I would look at the slides, and then you probably will see exactly how this is done. Okay. In fact, I mean this. I mean. Since there is a question, I assume that um, more will have. So what I will do is actually create a similar example, much shorter probably, um, that is similar to the citizen class uh, question, but it also has uh, a character array or a, an array of any form that you need to fill uh, with the constructor. So um, in that case also there, on Monday, I will submit a video where I will do a very similar example where also an array needs to be filled from the constructor. I think that is probably the easiest solution. And in the meantime, for the next couple of days, uh, look at the, the way um, it is uh, mentioned in the, in the slides, because I think there you will get um, the exact description of how to pass an array uh, in a function. Ah, the next question is a, is a practical one and a very good one because several people have asked me this. Um, so why did we in Moodle shift the exam? The exam was shifted because I uh, optimized things in Moodle and um, put the exam to the last lecture week that we have. Um, the problem is, however, that also there it's definitely not uh, set yet. So the exam um, is we've already asked the questions we needed to ask. Problem is that we have uh, about 180 students following this course. So um, um, we might have 180 students doing the exam, the written exam. And due to the situation now, we need to make sure that 180 people can be housed in multiple bigger rooms. Um, and this is uh, mostly um, a question of where we need to ask what questions um, uh, inside the university, because of course we will need then bigger rooms for sure, and we need also multiple rooms so that everybody can sit uh, one and a half meters apart. That's you know we have also the manpower to do this. This is not that much of a problem, but especially the 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 separation of students from each other is a real problem. Um, what I'm thinking is that we probably will not do it at the last week of uh, the lecture season at all. Uh, but it will be much later. Um, and the, the date that we will need to uh, get for this depends on when we can get the rooms that we need to. And this might be much later. So this might be not in July at all, um, but this might be in August or September. We will, I mean, we don't know yet. That is the question. Or that is the honest answer at the moment. But I'll try, or I am trying currently to do this as quickly as possible so that everybody knows when the exam will actually be. But what I can say for sure is that this will definitely not be the last um, uh, lecture week because that is logistically uh, very hard to do. Any other questions?
I'll just wait a little bit more. Oh, yes, one more. Um, the presentations, ah, that is also a very good question. So if you remember, um, initially I said we were going to do have to, we're going to have to do some presentations as well because that's what we tend to do. Um, so we normally have these exercise sessions where uh, our tutors can come to you, uh, help you as well. Um, and also um, from the third week onwards, I think, or from the second set of exercises, will ask you to explain your exercise um, or the, your solutions to the assignments. Um, the problem is that we can do, cannot do this also logistically. So also there, the sheer number of students following this course um, does not really allow us to call each one of you via Zoom and then explain or let us explain your code. I think that is very hard. So there are two solutions in this case. One of them is that if the exam is much later anyway, we can have one extra um, assignment at the end. Um, the other um, thing is that uh, we might uh, just drop this extra assignment and then um, rescale all the points from the main assignments um, so that those are not, I think, 10 points, but then uh, 12 points, for instance. Okay, then meanwhile, somebody said, I don't get uh, the exercise. Oh, yes, you can talk, of course. Just unmute yourself and ask. Um, hello, Professor. Um, I have a uh, question that uh, if in exercise number four, mm -hmm. it, it was written that uh, we, ha we don't have to ask the names on a command line. We right. have to hard code. Like, let's suppose we are initializing an object of a class. Mm -hmm. so we just hard code that name uh, when we are like uh, uh, initializing the objects by giving them names uh, by using the constructor. Mm -hmm. And uh, what will be the use of these names? Like they are not uh, serving any you know purpose. That is true. They're not. They're they are not being modified or, or even printed. That is absolutely true. Um, however, that's. I mean, this is basically an exercise first and foremost for how to write a class. And second, second of all, how to pass data to that class. So in this case, we indeed do, do not ask you to uh, let uh, a user input a name. We basically can just, uh, or you can write in your main function um, a string, for instance, that you pass to the constructor, or you can initialize, um, uh, just like we have uh, in the class, a character array. We can also initialize a character array as a string that's where I point, pointed, to, or that's how I pointed, or why I pointed to the slides of chapter six, because that's exactly shown there how to do that. Uh, okay, so, uh, second question is uh, mm -hmm. that you have mentioned that we have to initialize it with anonymous age with zero. So mm -hmm. we are doing constructor overloading, right? First constructor. No. In this case, um, when we want the anonymous, um, that is for the default constructor. I mean, yes, it's, the, it's, it's basically uh, constructor, or, or it's, it's, you could call it constructor overloading, although overloading is, um, in this case, um, well, yeah, it is overloading, you're right. So um, we basically want you to implement a default constructor. And if you've seen the slides or the videos, then we know that the default constructor is basically the constructor without any arguments. And in this default constructor, you should still initialize the data inside the class. So we should give still the name um, anonymous in this case. You should set the age to zero and the language to Dutch. Okay, and uh, second question is when a program runs, uh, the program asks the users uh, what, is, what is their language? And then uh, output will be hello and two times it will ask. Yes. But, but that's, a que that's the thing, you basically, uh, I mean, the question is really write a program that creates two objects of class citizen by implementing the constructors as above. Um, and then that only then, um, is, the only thing that's required is that those two objects then um, are um, using their say hello function. Um, and that is it. So basically you don't need to ask anything of the user. You basically, in your main function, just create two citizens um, ideally different ones, I would say. And then for each of those citizens, you um, execute the say hello function. Oh, okay, so we just hard code the language also. Exactly. And it just show the output. Uh, the, uh, the user don't have to enter anything. Exactly, exactly. It should show, however, that the way your constructors are implemented works. That is, I think, the only requirement in this exercise. 
Um, so, it, I mean, essentially, this exercise is the easy, simple one. Um, uh, the next one is a little bit trickier, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, this, this one is, is basically just creating a class and invoking, uh, or basically uh, using the constructor and, um, and um, invoking a function that belongs to this class. That's all you need to do here. Uh, okay, thank you. No problem. Then the next question is regarding the final exam. Some students are abroad. So is there any estimation for the final exam? This is exactly what I, what I said earlier. Um, no, there's no estimation. So it will be later than the lecture um, season. Um, but um, when exactly the exam that can be held is not clear. I do, however, want to make it um, uh, in person. And we need then also a solution, of course, for a few people that I know are still stuck abroad and where we don't know when they can uh, travel over here. But there's some different um, aspect, I would say. I think um, the overall majority is here um, and could come here. And I think it's very important that I know who can really program and can't. And the best way to do this is by letting people program on paper. So that still definitely won't change. Um, how will we be informed about the feedback of each exercise? I mean, that's basically that's something that you should see, have seen in Moodle already. So usually it takes now a week or two before you actually get your marks um, and when you get your feedback. And I, I instructed the tutors and I've seen also that the tutors do write something there. Um, we've also now, because of the feedback uh, from the last weeks, um, when it's perfect, we also say that it's perfect. Meanwhile, we've also been giving out awards. Some of you might have seen that already um, for people that have done things very efficiently or done things uh, in a very remarkably good way. Um, so um, that is normally done. Um, when tutors are subtracting points, uh, then that should be also remarked. If you have questions about that, then just ask your tutor. That is basically the, the way. You can also see CV there as well. That is the way things have happened in the past weeks already. I know that quite a few people had questions there. Um, but I think that is transparent or should be transparent, but ask your tutor if you have questions there. Syntax will be critically graded. Um, not sure what you mean about syntax. Um, we will look, for instance, at indentation. That's why I have this one slide um, uh, in Moodle about indentation and how important it is. Um, we sometimes uh, let certain things slip. You know, when you have just one small mistake in indentation, that is something that should not uh, count too much. But if indentation in blocks is completely wrong, and we've still seen that some students don't use indentation at all, then then points will be subtracted for sure. You know, as, as you were warned before. Um, so there's the, definitely something that, um, that will, be, uh, um, will be punished in a few points. Okay, somebody said that you'll have to look at the sidebar in Moodle and say grace to see the feedback, exactly. So you might have missed this, but there is a field in Moodle that then um, says, or gives a, a little bit of text uh, on the feedback. Of your, of your, of your uh, solutions. Okay. Any other questions? Doesn't seem to be. Okay. So uh, as a reminder from, uh, so last week there was a holiday, but from now on, every week we will have this until the very end. So until even the last lecture, uh, lecture week. Um, after that, um, uh, we can still support you, of course, but you are a little bit more on your own. So all the lecture slides will stop in that case, uh, even before the last week, I assume. Um, um, and also the support from the tutors will then slowly go down. So make sure that during the lecture season, you stay put. I mean, this is also where you can get half of your points still um, from all the assignments. Um, the other half you'll have to then get uh, on the exam. 
Um, do all the exercises have the same weight? Yes. So the first, so this, uh, I assume here the assignments is what you mean. Um, so for the assignments, the first assignment was kind of a bonus assignment uh, because it was such a simple thing. For us actually to make sure that everyone starts uh, filling in these, these assignments and all the assignments after that, so assignments two, three, and four that we have now, all are, as we envision it now, um, worth 10 points. Um, and after this, we will also have like, assignment five, which will also be uh, 10 points. If the question was about the, the exercises that are part of one uh, assignment, there we, have, uh, we do have a set um, weighting. And this is a weighting that you can actually um, think of yourself. So basically also here for um, assignment four, the first exercise is slightly uh, simpler as the second uh, exercise. So this will be uh, fewer points. So this will be for four points. The second exercise will be for six points. Okay, any more questions? This does not seem to be the case. Okay, so in this case, I would say um, we'll see each other next week. Um, and yeah, so basically, if you have any questions, do mail me. So I think um, the, the mailing is really important and it's very important that you stay focused on the lectures, uh, videos, and also especially the assignments because they slightly are now getting a little bit harder. And um, the longer you wait with filling in those assignments, the harder you might have it as well. Okay, so thank you all for your attention. This video will be posted as well today still. Um, and as I said, uh, next Monday, the next uh, lecture video should be online as well with this example that you've asked for. All right, then I wish everyone a good day and thank you for attending. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, have a nice day.